Welcome back. Let's take a look at Lab 480, which I call Pythonisms. This lab is mostly demonstration of some important Pythonic things to keep in mind. One Pythonic thing that you'll find makes your code much cleaner and easier to read and write and get correct is the fact that when you have a data type that has nothing in it, it is a falsehood. We studied that with the strings, that if answer is the identifier for something that came back from input, and the user gave us nothing, then what came to us was an empty string. So it is often that people say that if my answer is not equal to the empty, then I know that I got something, and I deal with it. But you can do this, if answer, because if answer is empty, it's false. So if it's false, we won't do it. Only if it is true, which means there is something in that string. Also, you might be tempted from another language to take the len of your list or any iterable and check that it's got data in it before you do your for loop through it. This is not a good idea. That very time consuming, especially if it's a big container of data to take the len, and Python handles it perfectly because even with nothing in my list, this doesn't crash or do anything you wouldn't want it to do. To do this experiment, we have a function is empty, something comes in, I report it, and now I'm doing the if on it. So if that thing that came in is truth, then I say so. Otherwise, I say so. We do it in the for loop on a container reporting that we're doing it. And then we're going through the container. When we find the first thing in the container, we're going to break. So we go beyond the else and say done. If the container is empty, it's going to go straight into the else. If the container is not really a container, it can't be iterated with a for loop or anything, then this code will be raising a type error, and I'll report that. This is going to happen to us for ints and floats. The zeros of those are false, but any number other than zero is truth. Also, while if container is truth, then we're going in one loop and then we're breaking back out. So we skip the else. If it is a false container having nothing in it, then we go straight down to the else for Python. Here's my test. I have various data types here. Now, an int is not really a container, but it does contain something that is zero or not zero. And if it's zero, it's a falsehood. Same with float. If it's zero, it's a falsehood. But if it's the tiniest float, it's truth. OK, so these are my data types. These are the empties of each type. And then here is the tiniest bit of data in each type. OK, so for each of them, I'm going to have a tuple that is the data type, what the empty looks like, and what having little something in it looks like. Because I zip those three tuples together, I will make myself a boundary line so I can see this is starting. I will report the data type, and then we'll see what happens when I run is empty on the empty, and on the something, and the for loops, and the while loops. The output, there was no unclumsy way for me to indicate an empty string when I'm printing, but that's what this is, and it is false. But it has an A in it, a character in it, then it's true. When I try to iterate through that empty string, it goes straight to the else, no looping. And when we have one datum in a string, it goes into the loop, and then it breaks, and we go straight to the done. With the while looping with the empty, then we go straight to the else with no looping. And when we have a little datum in there, we're going to loop through 
And then we break so we're done. But we did enter the loop. Alrighty. I hope that convinced you of that and strings. If you want to go on, let's look at the tuple. This is the empty tuple, which is, I find, a little bit strange, but I can understand that that's what it has to be. And so that's false, but if there's a datum in there, it's true. And if you iterate the empty tuple, there's no problem. It goes straight to the else. When we have a little datum in there, then it gets into that looping. While the same thing, this is a falsehood, therefore it does no looping, it goes straight to the else. And if there's a little data in there, it's going in. The list, same thing. There is the empty, and that's a falsehood with one datum in there. It's truth. When we iterate it, and it's empty, it goes straight to the else. No problem. And when there's datum in there, it goes into the loop. And then we push it out beyond the else. While looping, if it's empty, it goes straight to the else. But if we have a little datum in there, it's going to get in that loop. And then we pushed it out to be done. Here's our dictionary, which is also a falsehood when it's empty. And here's our dictionary that only has in it this key value pair. And that's true because it's got something in there. We can iterate it. Here's the empty one, it goes straight to the else. And if we iterate it and it has a little bit of data, then it goes into the loop and then we pushed it out to be done. When we're while looping the empty dictionary, it goes straight into the else. But if there's a little data, then it loops. That's just the behavior you want. I did these two as well. We did int and float. When they're zero, or 0, 0.0, 0, then that's a falsehood. If it has non-zero data in there, it's truth. When we iterate zero, well, you can't iterate an integer. Therefore, we got that type error. Same thing happened when we had it with an eight. Didn't matter. That's a, a type error to try to loop into an integer. When we while loop zero, go straight to the else. But an 8 is truth, so it will go around and around except that we stopped it in the first iteration. Now the float again, that's false. Tiny number is true. Uh, all numbers are true, other than 0. When we iterate it, of course, we get a type error, whether it's empty or not. But when we do the while loop on the 0, it goes straight to the else because that 0 is a false. Any other number, it's a true, and it goes into the loop. Okay, that helps your code to be aware of that. I stole this piece of code from an old Python book. I learned a lot from learning Python. I beefed it up a little just to remind you that a namespace defines attribute names. So if I have the x attribute here, really it is c.x. And that's its name. So X can be in many different namespaces and represent different attributes. Okay, so we know that's a global. Here we have a class C. And that X is a class level attribute. We have a method in there. When we print X, it does not print that X. It doesn't work its way out in that way. It would work its way out through nested functions, but not like that. And this x is c dot x, but we say x, therefore it finds the global. So this x, we are setting it into the instance of c that is the self. We're making an x in that. This f, which is a function, has an x. It's a local identifier in x. Some languages would call it an automatic variable because it only exists while the function is running and then it automatically goes away. Here we have a G and it's going to print X. Well, what's it going to do? It can only get to the global. 
All we did in the main is we made an object and we said object.m. So we're calling this method and we're going to print the global x. So that gives us the 11. And then we're going to set our x equal to 44 in our object. Therefore, when I print my object's x, we see the 44. When I print the class level x, we see the 22. When we see, print just the plain old x, it'll grab that global 11. When I run g, that x it sees is also the global 11. Now I'm going to try to print that function's x, and we get an attribute error. That x is only available while the function's running. We look at this function nest. There's nothing surprising in it. It'll just review what we already know. But it is interesting to contrast this with the next module, which will be a class nest. So here we have a global x and a global y. We have a function f1 that has a function defined within it. And that one has a function defined within it. In our main clause, we call f1. What the interpreter does is it makes the f2 object, which is function object, and it puts it inside that f1. Then it goes on down and calls f2. OK, now we set a y that's an f2. Here we're reading the definition. So there is now an F3, and we call it. And then F3 sees which X. Well, it will work its way out. There's no X here. There's no there, none there. So that will get the global X. But what Y does it see? None here. It's going to get F2's Y. And in the end of F1, we're going to see what F1 sees for X, and it also will see the global. After that, I left the interpreter open for introspection so that I could get into F1 and try to see F2's Y. And it doesn't see it until it's running. Let's look at the class nest. Here we see a global W. We have a class C1, and that C1 has an X. But then Nested within it is a class C2 definition that has a Y. And in that is a class C3 that has a Z. And some print statements. We're going to say in our main clause about to initialize. And then we're going to initialize C1. Let's look at the output. Here is the about to initialize that came out. Before that, a 10 and a 101 came out. This was surprising to me that what happens when the interpreter has a first read at a module, that it executes whatever is in the first column. Well, that's true of classes, too. When it reads class C1, it actually reads the first column and executes it. It has to, so that there is that 99 in C1 has to execute that, which means it also executes making our C2 class. And it's 100 and the C3 class, and it sets into C3 the Z, but because these are print statements that are in the first column of C3, not in method definitions, it'll do it. It'll print W. It can only get the 10. We'll print Z, and that's that 101, because it is in the local space, and there we see it. And that all happened before the initializing. That happened at read time. So I am looking at everything that is in my C1 object, as long as it doesn't start with some magic, because I'm not interested in those. And I see all I have in C1 is the C2 class and the X. The X and the C2 class. But I can work my way into C3 to look at that Z. Furthermore, because there's no encapsulation in this piece of code, I can set that Z and then look at it, and I have set way inside there. That's a class nest. And the important thing about class definitions is that the first column gets executed at read time, just like modules. Your exercises have nothing to do with the lecture.
The lecture was just to remind you of those things. These exercises, I'm asking you to think about them and make a prediction and then run them. Sometimes students get mad at me because I cannot explain some of this. So give these a try and we'll go over them when you're ready.